If you've ever heard of a superconductor, you are probably familiar with the confusion that surrounds them. They are inherently mysterious, well-known elements that change properties under different conditions to become almost magical metamaterials, disks of frozen metal that allow electricity to pass uninterrupted through them as if there was nothing in the way, and levitating devices that can stay in the air for as long as they are powered. Superconductivity is a discovery only about 100 years old, but promises an incredible future for us when we unlock their full potential. Handheld laser weapons, flying vehicles that float on invisible magnetic fields high above cities, and batteries that could not only be charged instantly, but hold as much power as a bolt of lightning. So why aren't we enjoying this future yet? Well, there's still a lot of research that we will need to do to take full advantage of their powers, and it all begins with their temperature. Why is the temperature of a superconductant so important, and what's taking so long? And more importantly, how do they work? Welcome back to Serious Science, and thank you for watching. Let's begin with what a superconductor actually is. In the world of electronics, the conductivity of a material is the measurement of how easily electricity can pass through that material without degrading into uselessness at the other end. For instance, copper and gold are extremely conductive, allowing electricity to pass nearly uninterrupted, while rubber and plastic have very little conductivity, which is why we insulate our wires with them. We want all of our electricity to stay within the system, and not bleed out through a bare strand of copper, which could connect to other wires accidentally and short out a system. But copper and gold are nearly perfect conductors, and not fully perfect. As a matter of fact, no known naturally occurring substance conducts electricity 100% perfectly, which means anything we build an electronic system with will always lose a small amount of power as that power travels through the system's different materials. But that's not good enough for us. We need something that will perfectly carry electricity without losses. The amount of power that is lost through the United States power grid alone due to the imperfect conductivity of the wires we use equals out to about 5%, and almost half of the power pushed through these lines are lost as heat energy. We need to transmit power very long distances, as in across a country, which would be degraded to nothing extremely quickly if we did not include boosters and transformers to give the electricity running through the grid enough force to make it all the way to its destination. Power needs to be pushed through anything that is not a perfect conductor, often needing just as much power to push it through the entire system as the amount of power that will reach their final destinations. This means that we have massive inefficiencies in our power distribution systems that will need to be resolved in order to reach peak efficiency. This is where a superconductor fits in. Superconductors do not degrade electricity as it passes through. If you were to run a wire of perfectly superconductive material from New York City to Los Angeles and attached a one volt battery to one end, an observer on the other end of the wire would be able to measure a perfect one volt output at the other end. No degradation, no boosting needed, no losses to the outside. But why is this important? Well, a lot of the problems we have with current electronics is that they lose energy in the form of heat, terrible batteries, or internal resistance. With superconductors, there would be no losses, batteries would be near-perfect containers and last drastically longer, and devices would be able to operate without additional wear and tear to their electrical systems as the energy pushes against their wires and produces heat. But what's going on with the levitating superconductors? Are they really examples of possible flying vehicles of the future? Yes, they are, but we still have a lot of work to do before we can catch a flying car to the under end of the country. The common superconductive example of a floating magnet circling a ring of frozen electronics is all due to an interesting thing that happens to materials as they become superconductors. And yes, I said become superconductors. There are no known naturally occurring superconductors that do not need special environments to function. This is why many superconductors are frozen to extremely low temperatures. But why does a metal need to get colder to conduct more electricity? It all has to do with the atoms inside of the conductors. As a material cools from a gas to a liquid, its atoms begin to slow down. These atoms may be traveling extremely quickly, as the average speed for an oxygen atom at normal conditions on Earth is faster than the speed of sound. The only reason we are not pummeled to death by these tiny atomic bullets is that they bounce harmlessly off of the atoms we are made of, and cause no damage. 
As our gas turns into a liquid, to a solid, it decreases in temperature as its constituent atoms slow down and carry less energy. Once the material becomes a solid, the atoms are relatively fixed in a single position within the material, but the atoms still vibrate with heat energy. This vibration, even if the material is in a frozen environment, is always present. In fact, the total ceasing of this motion within a substance will only occur at absolute zero, a temperature now thought to be impossible to reach. But these atoms do not have to stop moving fully to become superconductors. The atoms within a superconductor are still enough to carry electrons across from one atom to another without the vibration disconnecting the chain. This is easily done when certain materials are cooled to the point where electrons make it across the frozen and less energetic atoms without a loss in power. So freezing a material to slow down the movements of its atoms helps produce superconductivity, but only in certain materials, as different atomic elements will move at different speeds at the exact same temperature as a frozen superconductor. This means that only certain elements in man-made materials will superconduct at specific temperatures. So we already have materials that superconduct 100% of the time every time when kept at a certain temperature. Why aren't they being used in our power grids right now? Well, there's still the issue that most superconductors we know of operate at temperatures colder than any location on Earth and even lower than anything in our solar system. In other words, they can only superconduct in laboratory conditions and would fail to function at regular temperatures. Keeping a several hundred mile long stretch of superconductive wire cooled to these extreme temperatures would need more power than it can carry to keep itself cold. This is why humanity is pursuing room temperature superconductors, as they would need no special conditions to operate. But this perfect balance of temperature is often precarious, as a single degree warmer can destroy its conductive properties. But would these theoretical room temperature superconductors suffer from the same problems? Yes, they would, if we were unable to engineer a material that can operate in a spectrum of temperatures. The world is not a uniform temperature, even on scales of a few miles. A wire could run from a house that bakes in a 100 degree summer sun and travel under the shade of a forest that had a temperature of only 85 degrees. These changes in temperature would disrupt the electrical load and decrease efficiency if we did not create something that could weather these slight changes in temperature. But how do these cooled materials create the possibility for levitating devices? The flow of electricity is inextricably linked to the flow of a magnetic field. We regularly turn the rotation of magnets and wires into electricity with generators, and vice versa with motors. Any electrically charged material will be creating a magnetic field. So what happens when that carrying of electricity becomes perfect? Something unexpected happens, in that whatever material you are using will begin to repel weak magnetic fields. This is called the Meissner effect. If a superconductor is exposed to a weak magnetic field, the surface of that material will begin to produce tiny electrical flows that create a field opposite to the one being applied to the superconductor. This is due to the magnetic field being generated in proximity to the superconductor creating these tiny fields of electricity. Just as magnets surrounding a wire will create small electrical fields in regular conductors, this Meissner effect begins only when the material being cooled turns into a superconductor. Before then, these external magnetic fields can pass through the material without opposition. Only when the material becomes superconductive does its perfectly conductive properties begin opposing these external magnetic fields. But these fields will not be infinitely resisted, as a powerful enough magnet will disrupt a superconductor and erase its conductive properties by disrupting electron flow through that substance. This is an incredibly challenging hurdle to overcome, as any powerful enough magnetic field, even if it is a naturally occurring one, will cause our brand new superconductive power grid to fail. This hurdle is made even harder to counteract as there is no known material that shields objects completely from magnetic fields. An additional magnetic field to disrupt outer ones is not viable either, as that created magnetic field will interfere with our superconductivity as well. So what's really going on with those levitating ring experiments? The object floating around the ring is the superconductor, cooled to its critical point. The ring itself is a series of relatively weak magnets that interact with the superconductor's electromagnetic properties. The floating disk is conducting electricity perfectly, and therefore creating an opposite magnetic field to the small ones that it rests above. 
This is why you can change the orientation of the floating superconductor, as the floating conductor will always create a magnetic field that perfectly repels and matches the magnetic ring, no matter the direction. Of course, the floating disc warms up and it loses conductivity, as well as air friction slowing it down. But in an airless and supercooled environment, the pair would remain in perpetual motion forever. There are also two types of superconductors based off of their interactions with external magnetic fields, type 1 and 2. A type 1 superconductor will abruptly make this change as it becomes a superconductor, and all magnetic fields within the conductor will snap outwards and only exist on the surface after it becomes a superconductor. A type 2 makes this transition in two parts, as there is a middle ground it can occupy. As a type 2 is cooled towards superconductivity, it will begin creating tiny vortexes of magnetism within the material, becoming smaller and smaller until superconductivity is reached, where they disappear entirely. This is important as it can give us a bit of room to work with superconductors at slightly different temperatures, and may hold the secret to one that operates at a wide range of temperatures. If we were to create a room temp superconductor, flying vehicles would be simple to create, as strips of superconductive magnetic generators could be hidden underground in cities or under roads that would keep vehicles with magnetic plating on them suspended at whatever orientation and speed they originally had. Vehicles that flew using thrusters or jets would not need wings to stay in the sky, and could even stop completely and hover above a single spot. But we are already making incredible progress with superconductors every day, as we already have a material that operates at room temperature. Physicists at the University of Rochester in New York have created a mixture of hydrogen, carbon, and sulfur, which is squeezed together at 2.6 million times the pressure of Earth's atmosphere, and bombarded with laser light to induce superconductivity. Yes, it still needs extreme conditions to operate under, but it no longer needs extreme temperatures to do so. The experiment isn't the room temperature superconductor we would need, but it is a promising starting path towards that goal, as well as a valuable example to learn more from, as we now can switch out the extremeness of temperature for the extremeness of pressure. What other condition could be changed and still produce superconductivity? This condition could be something as simple as a change in insulation or the arrangement of an element's atoms. Superconductors aren't only found in labs, as there are many that are used commercially. Niobium-titanium is an alloy of the two metals that is used in superconductive magnetic rings to create supermagnets. The affordability of the alloy, coupled with an extreme resistance to external magnetic fields, makes this metal one of the most commonly used to create supermagnets for industrial use. They still have to be kept extremely cold, at about 10 kelvins, but this temperature is easily achieved. One of the most common uses for these supermagnets is in MRI imaging of which most systems employ these niobium-titanium magnets. These supermagnets are also used in particle accelerators, as a perfect usage of energy coupled with high outputs of containment magnetic fields is exactly what an accelerator strives to create. These magnets and conductors have many uses today, but what would a society with cheap room temperature superconductors use them for? One usage for superconductors is in electricity storage, as energy can be stored within the superconductive material itself and be charged and discharged in near instantly. These superconductive batteries are already a reality, but often need extremely powerful cooling systems to function. If a room temperature superconductive battery were to be developed, we would be able to instantly charge any device. We would also be able to instantly discharge however much electricity we have put into that battery which could be amounts equal to the power found in lightning, as this energy could be conducted perfectly, stored without loss, and would generate no waste heat due to pushing against impure wires. Even a thin superconductive wire would be able to support city grid levels of energy passing through it, as regular smaller wires would melt due to heat generation, while superconductive ones would be unimpeded by this effect. The instant discharging of electricity is just important as their instant chargeability. They could be used as extraordinarily powerful capacitors to run devices that need instant bursts of high energy to function. Capacitors charge up like tiny batteries until they reach a point where they can hold no more charge. When this occurs, it discharges all its stored electricity at once. With a superconductive capacitor, gargantuan amounts of power could be released to power laser weapons and railguns, as both would need instant and 
powerful releases of energy to function. A laser pistol using modern day capacitors would need thousands of them charging quite slowly for long periods of time before they could be fired once and charged back up afterwards. This is due to the high amounts of energy needed to create a dangerous laser burst. With a superconductive laser pistol, these amounts of power could be instantly loaded from a separate power source and be released without creating a gigantic blast of heat due to inefficient wires. A burst of heat that would most likely destroy the weapon and could seriously injure its user. Rapid releases of energy could also be used in space travel, as quick bursts from electronic thrusters to avoid collisions, or powerful magnets to maneuver in the vacuum would be incredibly valuable. These superconductors could even be used to get to space in the first place, as massive structures that run from the ground up into space could be held in place using magnetic fields, so that they do not fall apart under their own weight, or return to Earth with a crash. A long strand of pipeline suspended in a powerful magnetic field could be climbed by spacecraft as it gained speed until it left the structure to continue into an orbit saving millions on rocket parts and fuel that would have normally been used in order to get the craft into space the hard way. Magnetism also plays a massive role in medicine, as it is used to make scans, move surgical tools without intrusion, and even help treat cancerous tumors, as a recent experiment done with magnetic fields was shown to reduce the sizes of inoperable brain tumors. These superconductors could not only change the face of transportation, power supply, and warfare, but medicine as well. They will also be used in uses we cannot comprehend currently, as the technology that surrounds them grows and our understanding of superconductivity broadens. One thing is for sure with what we know about them now. If we can perfect them, we will unlock technologies that will change the universe for the better forever. Thank you all so much for watching.